All right, folks, we're, we're about to begin the, begin the festivities. Uh, my name is Sam S. Stryker. Uh, this program uh, is sponsored by the Institute of Judicial Administration, which is NYU Law School's principal arm to the judiciary. And we're very proud of the Brennan Lectureship, which is a, an event that honors state judges. And state judges carry most of the freight, carry most of the water in our justice system. And it's great to be able to honor them in this way. Um, our Chief Justice tonight will be introduced by Lauren Goldman, who's a graduate of NYU School of Law and a partner uh, in charge of the, uh, the appellate branch and Mayor Brown, we're very proud of her. So I'm just gonna turn it over to Lauren. Good evening. Oh, okay, it's on. <laughs> I've always been trained to check to make sure that the microphone is actually on. As, uh, as an NYU alum uh, and as a member of the advisory board for the Institute of Judicial Administration, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome you all here to the 26th annual Brennan Lecture on the state courts and social justice. This lecture is hosted and organized by IJA under the leadership of professors Oscar Chase, Sam S. Stryker, and Troy McKenzie, who are all here with us tonight. As uh, Professor S. Stryker mentioned, IJA is the principal link, the principal connection between NYU Law School and the judiciary. And for more than 60 years, IJA has been committed to judicial education, outreach to the legal profession, and discourse about the administration of justices. One of the things that amazed me as I started preparing for tonight was to learn that 37% of all sitting appellate judges in the United States, both state and federal, are alumni of IJ's judicial education program, which takes place every summer. That is a pretty incredible statistic when you think about it. And the work of the Institute has become ever more important over the past few decades as the workload of the federal and state judiciary has increased exponentially. The IJA Brennan Lecture focuses on and celebrates the work of the state courts. Justice William Brennan is probably best remembered for his three plus decades on the US Supreme Court. But before he was appointed to that court in 1956, he served at all three levels of the New Jersey state judicial system, which culminated in a stint on the New Jersey Supreme Court. And these roots deeply informed Justice Brennan's understanding of federalism and his deep appreciation of the role that state courts play in safeguarding individual liberties and the constitutional rights of our citizens. 25 years ago this month, IJA hosted its very first Brennan Lecture, which I remember because I was there as a 1L. It was delivered by alumna and then head of the New York State Court of Appeals, Judith Kay, and she spoke about state courts at the dawn of a new century. And tonight, we have the enormous honor of welcoming Chief Justice Maite Oranos Rodriguez of the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico. She will deliver the 26th annual IJA Brennan Lecture entitled Gender Equality and the Rule of Law. By literally any measure at all, the Chief Justice's story, her biography, is one of firsts of extraordinary legal talent and of dedication to the rule of law. She is the first openly LGBT Chief Justice, not only in the history of Puerto Rico, but in the history of the entire United States. She was appointed to her post on February 22, 2016, at the age of 43 which makes her the youngest Chief Justice in Puerto Rico's history and only the third woman to hold that post. She served as an... <laughs> yeah, it's pretty darn inspiring. She served as an Associate Justice on that court from 2014 to 2016. The Chief Justice is married to appellate judge Gina Mendez Miro, who is also with us tonight. And in 2018, they became the parents of boy-girl twins. The Chief Justice began her legal career as a law clerk to former Chief Justice Federico Hernandez Denton. 
She served as Deputy Solicitor General of Puerto Rico when she was still in her 20s. After that, she served as Acting Solicitor General, and she served as General Counsel of the City of San Juan, and also found time to spend a few years in private practice working mostly on civil and commercial litigation. She graduated from the University of Puerto Rico School of Law, where she served on the Law Review, and she obtained an LLM from Columbia, but in light of all of her other sterling accomplishments, we will try not to hold that against her. <laughs> in her tenure to date, the Chief Justice, more seriously, has already accomplished a number of really important measures that ensure equal access to the courts and promote gender equality. She has modernized Puerto Rico's judicial system, implementing a number of technological initiatives that expand access to the courts and promote efficiency, often working hand in hand with other governmental entities and with nonprofit organizations. And she has established several protections for victims of gender-based violence, including specialized courts and the ability to obtain a temporary order of protection without having to go to court to do so over video. The Chief Justice was recently elected to the Board of Directors of the Conference of Chief Justices. She's also a member of the Permanent Commission on Gender and Access to Justice of the Ibero-American Judicial Summit, and she received the 2018 LLSA Impacto Award in recognition of her inspiring leadership and her commitment to justice and public service. Chief Justice Oranos Rodriguez has not held her post during an easy time in the history of Puerto Rico. As we all know, in September of 2017, the island was hit first by Hurricane Irma and then two weeks later by the devastating Hurricane Maria. Hurricane Maria was the worst national disaster in the history of the island. It caused $90 billion worth of damage and it caused blackouts that took nearly a year to recover from and to turn the power back on from. The Chief Justice demonstrated extraordinary leadership in the wake of the storms to maintain access to the court system. And in 2019, the National Center for State Courts presented her with its Distinguished Service Award, which recognized her unflagging devotion to public service and her energetic and calm restoration of court services after those storms. Last summer presented a different set of challenges to the rule of law in Puerto Rico. As a popular uprising resulted in the ouster of Governor Ricardo Rossello after messages that he had exchanged on a chat forum with other top ranking officials were made public. He was replaced by Pedro Pierre Luisi, who was the Secretary of State of Puerto Rico, but the Puerto Rico Supreme Court quickly held that Mr. Pierre Luisi's appointment had been unconstitutional and replaced him with Governor Juan de Vasquez, who still serves today. In a concurring opinion, the Chief Justice explained that this was the most important juncture in Puerto Rico's history as a democracy. The summer of 2019, she wrote, will be remembered as an unprecedented moment in which Puerto Ricans of all ages, ideologies, backgrounds, and creeds threw themselves into the street to demand more from their government. In short, we are extraordinarily fortunate to have Chief Justice Aranos Rodriguez here tonight to speak about gender equality and the rule of law. This lecture is meant to spark discussion and the Chief Justice will be happy to take questions at the end of her talk. So please write your questions on the index cards that have been provided. They'll be collected before the Q&A. And please join me in welcoming the Chief Justice. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren Goldman, for that very nice and kind introduction. I would also like to thank Dean Morrison, the Board of Directors of NYU School of Law, and the Institute of Judicial Administration for the true honor of delivering the 26th annual William Brennan Jr. Lecture on State Courts and Access to Justice. I am humbled to join the distinguished group of legal scholars that have been part of the lecture series throughout the past 26 years. Today, I have the daunting task of following in the footsteps footsteps of those brilliant legal minds 
an accomplished jurist, and must do so in the context of paying, paying tribute to one of the great champions of social justice, Supreme Court Justice William Brennan Jr. Gender equality and the rule of law is a lofty title for this lecture, befitting, I believe, the importance of the topic. It further touches upon issues that are near and dear to me. Gender equality is central to the various projects and initiatives that we are working on and advancing in the Puerto Rico court system. Because the Brennan Lecture is about the role of state courts in promoting social justice, I will focus on sharing my experiences on the specific initiatives that Puerto Rico court system has developed and implemented. I hope this lecture serves as a tribute to Justice Brennan's doctrine of equality based upon the premise of human dignity as the cornerstone, cornerstone of our social norm, as well as its vision of the role of the courts and the role they must play in achieving the goals of equality, fairness, and justice. <laughs> Furthermore, I will illustrate how we are working towards reaching that goal of equality under the law through practical and real life application in specific policy initiatives and programs. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said of Justice Brennan that he contributed monumentally to the advancement of liberty and justice, equal and accessible for all. Justice Ginsburg also spoke of what retired Supreme Court Justice David Souter, a colleague and close friend of Justice Brennan's, termed the gravitational pull of the Brennan Otal, referring to Justice Brennan's vast body of jurisprudence. Throughout his tenure on the court, he used its platform to achieve social justice, which he believed was the court of the US Constitution and the Bill of Rights. In this pursuit, he continuously pushed his fellow justices to take on a variety of seminal social justice, social, social issues, and was the architect of landmark decisions that secured the individual rights of minorities, led to reapportionment of voting districts, and enhance First Amendment freedom for newspapers and other media, among many others. Justice Brennan's constitutional jurisprudence focused on the concept of equality and liberty that are recognized in the Declaration of Independence, protected in the U.S. Declaration of Independence, protected in the U.S. Constitution, sorry, with, with the Bill of Rights, and further advanced by the 14th Amendment. Yet, little is discussed about his pivotal role that he played in the evolution of gender equality in the United States. The fact is that his belief in the dignity and the equality of all persons extended to seeking equal rights for women, and it is reflected in his gender jurisprudence. As Justice Ginsburg stated, Frontiero, Frontiero and versus Richardson was the first in a line of, of Brennan opinions holding that our living constitution obligates governments to respect women and men as persons of equal stature and dignity. In Frontiero, Brennan sought to extend the strict scrutiny standard applied to racial discrimination to claims of gender discrimination. Taking a strong stand on the issue, he stated, and I quote him, there can be no doubt that our nation has had a long and unfortunate history of sex discrimination. Traditionally, such discrimination was rationalized by an attitude of romantic paternalism, which in practical effect put women not on a pedestal, but in a cage. He further recognized that the position of women in America has improved markedly in recent decades, but that women still faced pervasive, although at times more subtle, discrimination in our educational institutions, in the job market, and perhaps more conspicuously in the political arena. Almost 50 years after Frontiero, Justice Brennan's words still stand true. As I indicated, this topic is of enormous importance on a legal and social level. Moreover, it is fundamental to me on a personal level. I speak to you as a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Puerto Rico, but also as a daughter, a wife, a mother, 
to Madame Borja, our 20-month-old twins. The societal context in which I am giving this lecture is undoubtedly a difficult and complex one. Polarized and turbulent, where the political, economic, and social crises are causing constant great divisions, as well as tremendous uncertainty and fear for the future. Since my appointment as Chief Justice in 2016, and more so after the devastation brought upon Puerto Rico by Hurricane Maria, later by the political and governmental turmoil of the island in the summer of 2019, and these last days by the thousands of displaced families in the southwestern part of the island affected by the earthquakes, my work as Chief Justice has centered on providing Puerto Rico with a strong and independent judicial branch one that assures the constancy of the rule of law and provides equal justice for all, never more important than in times of crisis. As judges, we strive to be fair arbiters of legal controversies, but we must never divorce ourselves from the real life consequences our decisions have upon those that seek resolution or redress in our court system. As such, we must look beyond the abstract definitions of the two terms that comprise the title of this lecture, gender equality and the rule of law. In our role as judges, we must not only understand what gender equality means, or is supposed to mean, on a conceptual basis, particularly in relations to the normative rule of law, but we must use that knowledge and apply it in every single case always taking into consideration the specific circumstances of the parties. While this principle holds true to the management and resolution of cases that come before federal courts, it is of particular, particular salience in our state courts. That is because, as was mentioned before, it is in state courts that the vast majority, a staggering 95% of issues and controversies affecting the day-to-day -day lives of all peoples are seen and adjudicated. Matters as diverse as those that fall under the rubric of family law, divorce, child custody, and child support, and state criminal law, from the most serious to the most minor ones. As such, the impact of state courts upon our society is much more substantial and pervasive, in great part due to the sheer number of individuals and entities that are directly involved in the myriad of cases and the wide open uh, and wide scope and diverse nature of the issues that come before the state courts. Now, much has been written on the definition and implications of the term the rule of law. And while there is agreement among scholars regarding the scope of the term, it is not an uncontested matter. That said, I shall focus briefly in its direct impact on my dual role as a judge and as chief justice and administrator of the court system in Puerto Rico. There appear to be two main schools of thought as to what the term rule of law encompass, or should encompass. And when I refer to the rule of law, I look at it through a wide lens of the term, which places the pursuit of the public good as an essential element thereof, and which then leads us to the goals of achieving equality under the law including, and specifically, gender equality as essential to the achievement of the respect for, adherence to, and promotion of the rule of law. In this vein, the term the rule of law has been defined as signifying, and I'm quoting, the empires of law and not of men, indicating that this entails the subordination of arbitrary power and the will of public officials as much as possible to the guidance made and enforced to serve their proper purpose, which is the public good, or res publica. In her 2018 lecture before this very forum, Chief Judge Janet Di Fiore defined the term similarly and then stated, and I quote her, the rule of law has guided a democratic system and served us extraordinarily well supporting a civil society that, despite serious flaws and historic injustices, has been characterized by freedom, opportunity, and human progress. She added that, however, 
we cannot be complacent. The vibrancy, vitality, and viability of the rule of law can never be taken for granted. The 2012 World Development, Development Report on Gender Equality and Development defined gender equality in its legal dimension as the distribution among women and men of rights and entitlement and the different capacities of men and women to access the mechanisms for claiming and enforcing those entitlements. The author of the background paper discussing the elements of this 2012 report added that because of the central role law and justice institutions play in fostering or hindering gender equality, any approach to judicial reform needs to take into consideration how gender comes into play. That is, how differences in women's and men's social, economic, and legal endowments affect the way that they perceive law and justice, and how their everyday experiences in law and justice simultaneously shape their patterns of social life, economic, and legal endowments. At its most fundamental level, and as it is defined by the United Nations, equality between women and men refers to the equal rights, responsibilities, and opportunities of women and men and girls and boys. It does not mean that women and men will become the same, but rather that women's and men's rights, responsibilities, and opportunities will not depend on whether they are born or identify themselves as male or female. Consequently, applying the concept of equality as both a principle and as a right does not mean seeking a magical mathematical formula. On the contrary, it simply implies that the interests, needs, and priorities of both men and women will be taken into consideration when it comes to rights and access to resources. The relevance and importance of addressing various, the various forms and manifestations of gender equality, both those that are obvious and overt, as well as those that are more, ins more insidious, cannot really be overstated. It is our duty to bring the issues of gender inequality out into the open and to address the nefarious consequences that gender inequality have upon our society as a whole to promote and achieve a more just world for all. Justice Brennan highlighted in Frontiero, a paternalistic attitude has become firmly rooted in our national consciousness. Furthermore, the empirical evidence around the globe demonstrates that it is still the cause of discrimination and violence against women. The data clearly shows that gender inequality is a major cause and effect of poverty, as it is commonly the result of exclusion and the absence of equal opportunities. The historical denial of autonomy, limited access to education and support services, together with women's minimal participation in decision-making processes, have had the detrimental effect of leaving women at the periphery of society. Other harm harmful practices also persist, such as sexual harassment at the work and in institutions of higher education, unequal retribution for labor, and unequal access to and control over capital and property. These are all forms of discrimination based on sex, which are unfortunately are also the root of gender-based gender -based violence. In fact, in the United States, one out of four women experience domestic violence in its different uh, manifestations. That is physical injury, sexual aggression, psychological trauma, and stalking, among many others. This is beyond alarming, considering that studies indicate that violence against women and girls is not only an extreme human rights violation that strips them of their dignity and well-being, but that it also generates huge economic costs for women and families, as well as for communities and society. We should all be worried by the negative impact that gender-based violence has on women's participation in education, employment, and civic life, as it, is, as it clearly undermines poverty reduction and limits progress. 
Promoting gender equality and empowering women can transform societies. Equality between women and men is not only a human rights issue, as I mentioned, but also a catalyst for sustainable development and economic growth. There is nowhere on earth, nowhere, where women have achieved true equality. The economic forum, the World Economic Forum projects that equality in the United States is still another 208 years away. 208 years away. That means it will take another five generations for us to see gender equality. There is terrible news, terrible news for our daughters and sons, and it must concern and fully engage men as well as, as all sectors in society, from the government to the academia to the private industry. An in-depth discussion of the concept of implicit bias, both in general terms and as well as its application in judges uh, and in the administration of justice, is well outside the scope of this present lecture. However, because the role of implicit bias plays in unequal treatment and outcomes in the management and resolution of otherwise similarly situated cases, I briefly touch upon the subject. In the particular case of Puerto Rico judiciary, we are addressing the problematic implications of the phenomenon to the egalitarian administration of justice through, among others, mandatory judicial training and continuous education on the matter. This is consistent with our policy and public policy and also essential to our commitment to equality for all in the application of the rule of law on the basis of gender. In very broad terms, the phenomenon and concept of implicit bias in our judicial system has, it, has been described as follow. And I quote, numerous studies have shown that even though we may not be aware of the bias that lurks within, our acculturation results in implicit bias in each of us that is imprinted into our subconscious and is as intractable, intractable as it is pervasive. I'm sorry, it is, as, it is as intractable in its placement, I'm sorry, as it is pervasive in its influence. This bias presents in all jurisdictions all levels, or all levels of judicial system, and in all types of cases. It affects our judgment, as well as our actions, and thereby infects the very institution that we depend upon for fairness and just resolution of disputes, the courts. Therefore, in practice, despite the good intentions of the judiciary, unconscious and pervasive biases permeate the judicial system and its decision-making process. Numerous studies on fairness in the courts show that, ironically, these biases most often impact historically disadvantaged groups, like women and racial minorities, some of the very groups that are subject of the anti-discrimination legislation meant to protect those specific rights. And while the problem of implicit bias is complex, there are measures that court administrators, uh, court administrators may take so that the judiciary is well equipped to handle all cases in a fair and equitable manner, including those pertaining to gender issues. Even though there are no magic pills, the judges can or take any uh, fail-safe protocols that can be followed. When it comes to gender, there are various countermeasures to minimize the impact of implicit bias in judicial decisions. Training can help judges understand the extent of their biases and promote self-correction. Furthermore, continued legal education and judicial education and special protocols can enable judges to bring a gender perspective to the, to the adjudication of the case. This is what is known as gender mainstreaming, a concept drawn from international law widely recognized by the Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, which is defined as, and I quote, the process of assessing the implications for women and men in any planned action. An independent, fair, and impartial judiciary is indis indispensable to our, to our system of justice. 
Moreover, strong, autonomous, and inclusive judicial institutions are necessary for upholding the rule of law and eliminating all forms of discrimination as affirmed in the declaration of high-level meetings of the Assem of a General Assembly on the rule of law adopted in 2012. As I mentioned, state courts are the backbone to the American judicial system or the justice system. And moreover, as the face of justice, state courts and judges are in the front lines working to resolve the most sensitive and complex problems that affect the lives, liberties, property, and safety of our people. That includes foreclosure, domestic and gender violence, child abuse and neglect, drug-related offenses, juvenile delinquency, among others. Every day, our local courthouses, particularly our lower courts, deal directly with many people and a variety of controversies. That is why, as current statistics continue to reflect ongoing patterns of women's poverty, exclusion from the public sphere, and increased exposure to violence and unequal rights, the importance of the judiciary and state courts as change agents towards gender equality cannot be overstated. Judicial decisions play a major role in defining the character of the democratic state and in giving meaning to the rule of law. For this reason, gender equality is further advanced by having independent and impartial courts where judges base their decisions on relevant facts, evidence, and the law without discrimination or prejudice. Society expects judges to be objective, knowledgeable, independent, discerning, practice, practical, sensitive, but above all, they expect them to be fair. Consequently, they must discharge their responsibilities to the highest of standards in order to maintain the trust and confidence of the public, which is critical to upholding the rule of law. Pursuant to the provisions of the Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico Judiciary Act, the Chief Justice of the Puerto Rico Supreme Court serves a dual role. The first role is as a jurist, entrusted in conjunction with the other eight justices, with being the final arbiters of most of the cases that come before the court. The other, being in charge of administering the workings of the judicial branch and setting, setting its public policy and priorities. This is more heterogeneous and lends itself to the establishment of programs and initiatives which will potentially impact the, the daily lives of most people in Puerto Rico. Among some of the initiatives that state courts should promote are the expansion of specialized courts designed specifically to deal with the most common modality of gender crime, domestic violence, whether in the form of restraining order applications or the filing of criminal charges. These courts improve access by providing specifically trained judges and personnel that can process cases more efficiently and deliver integrated services with the required sensibility. Despite the progress made, Puerto Rico is still plagued by alarming rates of inequality, homophobia, and gender-based violence. Statistics offer a chilling snapshot of the endemic nature of domestic violence in Puerto Rico. A recently published report found that 266 femicides in Puerto Rico during the five-year period between 2014 to 2018. That means that one woman is a victim of gender-based violence every seven days. I can assure you that the numbers are much higher. These rates of gender-based violence require the urgent intervention of all sectors of our society, and that, of course, includes the state, ju the state judiciary. Given the enormous social impact, impact of this horrific reality, notwithstanding the difficulties we have faced in the past few years, our judicial branch has focused many of its resources in promoting gender equality by equipping the courts to eradicate violence against women and providing access to justice. 
In 2017, before, during, and after the unprecedented challenges unleashed by Hurricane Maria's landfall, our focus was on providing access to the most disadvantaged communities. Amid the emergency, one of the principal issues that we prioritized was attending to the cases of domestic violence, which as you know, increased exponentially during a crisis. Between September, the month of the hurricane, and December of 2017, judges were readily, readily available to serve victims and provide protection against their abusers, <laughs> and the local courts issued 2,469 protective orders. Additionally, despite budget cuts and the challenges brought upon in the aftermath of natural disasters, we continue to expand access to justice through our specialized domestic, court, uh, domestic violence courts. These courts were created in 2007 to promote the safety of the victim, to hold the aggressor accountable, and to strengthen the coordination of support services through collaboration with different entities, all within a secure environment that facilitates the fair and fast solution of the controversies. In 2018, just nine months after Hurricane Maria, we inaugurated our seventh specialized court in Carolina. Later, in 2019, we established a new specialized court in Ponce for the benefit of the southern part of the island. With this last expansion, we are currently able to impact about 83% of the population of Puerto Rico, which can now directly access services and specialized attention in domestic violence cases. In addition, we recently established our first gender violence court at the mountainous region in Utuado. With this pilot program, the judicial branch of Puerto Rico is, I believe, at the forefront in handling gender-based violence cases, becoming the first jurisdiction in the United States to manage sexual violence and domestic violence cases, both criminal and civil, through the same specialized court model. In advancement of these goals, we are complying with the mandate of continuous education for the members of the judiciary through seminars on gender-related matters such as domestic violence, and are in the process of perfecting a gender-sensitive curriculum by which judges can build their capacity to employ a gender perspective on deciding cases. We see judicial adjudication with gender perspective as a mechanism to effectuate the right to equality. We, or at least I am convinced, this approach allows courts to achieve substantive and procedural equality through the interpretation and application of the law. Using a gender perspective when deciding cases implies that the principle of equality will guide and control how judges conduct their legal analysis. This new curriculum intends to educate judges on how to incorporate a gender sensitive approach that can attempt to redress gender inequalities by taking into account the differences, the differences between men and women's needs and realities. To achieve this, we must, among other things, learn to read and interpret the facts of a case without the contamination that comes from stereotype conceptions of our own and those of the parties involved. We must also learn to question the facial neutrality of laws and norms and evaluate the disparate impact that facially neutral laws may impose. In addition, judges must learn to question if their expectations of the parties would be different if they were replaced with a heterosexual man, for example. I will give you an example. Would the expectations of a victim's response be different if we imagine her being replaced by a man? Would our expectations of behavior change if we assign a stereotypically feminine role to a party? For example, if it were a man asking for a paternity leave. A gender perspective would allow a judge to see beyond, to identify how, how gender assumptions can affect people's lives and can help determine if a different treatment is necessary and legitimate.
Adjudication with a gender perspective not only expands access to justice, but can help combat impunity, discrimination, and inequality, as well as send a message that human rights violations can be prevented, recognized, and remedied. It is a bold method that has long been recognized at the international level, and I believe that it is a new approach for promoting the goals of gender inequality. Because of Puerto Rico's unique legal system and history, we benefit from our participation not only at the Conference of Chief Justices here in the United States, but also, as you mentioned, at the Ibero-American Judicial Summit, which is a cooperation and experience exchange body composed by the judicial entities of the Ibero-American regions, countries that share a common heritage. As a member of the Permanent Gender and Access to Justice Commission, I am working together with the just, uh, judiciary of Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Spain, and Nicaragua to strengthen and eventually implement a guide for mainstreaming gender in the delivery of justice. The commission is working on a tool that can help judges decide cases with a gender perspective by consulting and correcting stereotypes that perpetuate discrimination against women and other vulnerable groups. With the aid and collaboration of the Ibero-American Judicial Summit, we hope to adopt a protocol for judicial decision-making with a gender perspective in Puerto Rico. In the end, we hope that the results of the implementation of this approach to the judicial decision-making is greater access to justice for those who, because of their biological, physical, sex, or gender characteristics, are at risk of having their rights ignored. Furthermore, in conformity with my belief that education is the most effective way to transform our society and promote equality between men and women, the most recent, recent initiative by the judicial branch involves a public service campaign designed to educate the community about gender equality and the judicial remedies available to domestic violence victims. Finally, and without being exhaustive, in May of 2020, we will hold, as our annual Judicial Congress, a conference entitled Justice with a Gender Perspective, From Theory to Practice. It will be the first conference of judicial education in Puerto Rico dedicated exclusively to the topic of gender. Despite the progress, epic challenges remain to achieve gender equality. The experience in Puerto Rico, however, demonstrates that the courts play a crucial role in the effective protection of human rights and the advancement of equality. Meeting these aspirational yet ultimate, ultimately achievable goals requires a significant investment in time and resources. Thus, any initiative must be selected carefully and only after identifying those with the highest success rates and the potential for replicability throughout the judicial system across the island. Again, while the goals of an egalitarian access treatment within the judicial system and outcomes are challenging to achieve, we will not stop striving to attain them. They are essential to the notions of fundamental fairness that must guide all of our efforts and actions and all the actors within the judicial branch. It is with this thought that I leave you with a quote from the ultimate striver for equal treatment under the law for all, Justice Brennan. If we are to be a shining city upon a hill, it will be because of our ceaseless pursuit of the constitutional ideal of human dignity. For the political and, little, and, for the political and legal ideals that form the foundation of much that is best in American institutions, ideals jealously preserved and guarded throughout our history, still form the vital force in creative political thought and activity within the nation today. As we adapt our institutions to the ever-changing conditions of national and international life, those ideals of human dignity, liberty, and justice for all individuals will continue to inspire and guide us because they are entrenched in our constitution. The Constitution, with its Bill of Rights, thus has a bright future, as well as a glorious past, for its spirit is inherent in the aspirations of our people. 
Thank you so much for the opportunity to address you and for your attention tonight.